All right. So keystone species, when I look in through the chat here, everyone has it correct. It's something that's important to the environment. It's something important to the local ecology. It's something that is um, necessary for the ecosystem. So all of those things, you've hit it right on the head. Um, but before we get going, uh, I just also want to mention that um, if you're commenting, which I hope that you do, and I hope that you have questions, just make sure that it's on topic to what we're talking about and relevant to the situation here. Um, and I also want to mention that I am by, need, by no means an expert. So if you have questions, questions that I cannot answer. Um, I hope that you ask them still um, and that I will find someone later who can help you with those. All right, so some of you, like I mentioned, you talked about what are keystone species. Um, so just really quick talking about the basics of them. So in every single ecosystem, there is those interlocking um, relationships between something, the things that are alive and the things that are not alive. So when we talk about those, we call them abiotic and biotic factor. So biotic, bio means living. So these are the animals, the plants, um, the bacteria, the organisms that are there. And then you also have your abiotic factors, which are things that are not technically alive. There's some people that would be like, well, soil is alive. Well, kind of. It's like the soil and it's the water and it's the rocks and all of the other things that are not plants, animals, or organisms. Um, so there was a person, um, Robert Payne in the 60s, so not that long ago, honestly, um, that made this huge environmental breakthrough. Um, he was doing some research in a tidal pool in an area um, called um, in an area called um, Macaw Bay, which is in Washington. And he decided to look at the starfish or the sea stars there. And he took a single starfish species out of this area and he just wanted to see what would happen. So he looked at this little tidal pool, this ecosystem in itself, and he took every single one of every um, single species of starfish. So he picked a single species, he took all of those kinds away and he wanted to see what would happen. Um, well, I think we all probably can understand what happened is that the ecosystem completely changed. Um, so basically, um, he removed all those. He wanted to see what would happen. And I'm not sure if a lot of you know that starfish are actually predators. So they're not like a lion or a tiger or anything like that when we think of a predator, but they do eat other things. Um, so basically, the whole ecosystem changed. And he realized, he came to this epiphany, that species, certain species, play this critical role in the structure and the function of their environment. And for this happenstance, ecosystem, it was that starfish species or sea star is what I'm supposedly saying wrong. It's a sea star, not a starfish. All right, so basically he concluded um, that some species have a huge influence on their ecosystem and some species, they matter, but not to the point of a, what we call a keystone species. So that's what he named it, a keystone species. Um, basically other species are there for a reason and everything's there for a reason, but certain species can topple a whole community if they are not there. And those are those keystone species. So definition by the dictionary, a keystone species can be any organism. And remember, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, all of those things can be a keystone species. Um, basically, they are the glue that holds the ecosystem together. Um, so if they are removed, it sets off a chain of events that basically will change the biodiversity and the structure and the function of that ecosystem into something completely different. So they are critically linked to everything else that is in that ecosystem. All right, so it is not an official uh, designation when we talk about uh, keystone species. It's not a title like an endangered species or anything like that. Um, but it's also good to remember that it doesn't mean that any other animal is less or more important. Um, there's a huge debate actually among biologists and scientists and people who work with these species that kind of think, well, maybe this is one, maybe this is not. Uh, so when we talk about that, um, there's a huge debate about who actually deserves that title as a keystone species. Um, some say that it also kind of oversimplifies one animal or plant's role in the environment. Um, but also when we think about that, um, keystone species, when you're going to see here in a second, some of the species are not people's favorite species. So it also gets them to understand um, and bring light to the public about the species that a lot of 
to other species that um, may not get that in general. Uh, so next, I want to go ahead and kind of talk about the different types of keystone species. So when we talk about keystone species, it's like an umbrella term, but there's all these different parts that fit underneath and the different kinds of them. So one of those is a predator. So um, this is not the only one, um, but we're going to talk about just keystone predators. Um, a great example is actually a gray wolf. Um, in Nebraska, it's kind of odd. Gray wolves are actually considered an endangered species. We don't have a population of them. We have the um, environment for them. They have been here historically in Nebraska, um, but we still consider them an endangered species. And if you've been paying attention to wildlife news, um, there have been a few several reports of what we call wolf-like creatures here in Nebraska this past year and the year before in 2022 and 2021 and 2020. Um, so it, it's a possibility that we are seeing a shift in different types of animals as well. Uh, so for predators, these animals keep the populations and the range of their prey in check. Um, so if you would remove this predator, this keystone predator from the ecosystem, it would impact um, all the other predators that are out there, but then also the other animal and plant species that might be farther down on that food chain and also the species that this continuous um, predator hunts for. So for instance, our gray wolves, um, they hunt everything from uh, elk and other uh, like hares and rabbits. If they were removed, those other prey items might continue to explode in population um, and that would not be good for the ecosystem either. So um, so if you think about that, we call that a trophic cascade. So removing a single species causes basically chaos underneath. All right, another type of um, keystone species that we might not think of very much is called an ecosystem engineer. So engineers are organisms that create, they change, or they sometimes can destroy habitat. Some of you might be thinking about, well, why would I want a keystone species that destroys habitat? It might destroy the current habitat, but it creates new habitat for other species. A great example of this is our beavers. Um, so we have beavers in Nebraska, they're quite prevalent, um, but a beaver is like a key example of an ecosystem engineer. So if you think about all the things that, be that beavers do, um, they create dams, they make lodges, they dam up rivers, they create wetland habitats, um, they completely change, create, and sometimes destroy that current habitat that's there. Um, for instance, a beaver that's on a river, um, the river ecosystem relies on beavers because they take down those old or those dead trees um, that they use to make their dams. And a lot of people uh, think that they're nuisance pets. There's a lot of people that that ask to have beavers removed from a certain areas because they cause flooding. Um, they might damage some of the trees that are there um, and people don't like that. But the fact is that they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're creating habitat for other um, animals and other plants. Um, so basically what beavers are doing is they allow healthier trees um, to grow in abundance. So they're taking down those trees that are damaged or they're sickly or they're just in the way um, and they're allowing new trees to grow. They also divert the water with their dams. So they create wetlands um, for a variety of plants, animals, and other things to thrive. Um, and if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have a lot of our fish species. We wouldn't have a lot of bird species. We wouldn't have a lot of other things if beavers didn't create that habitat for them. All right. And then you also have one, this is kind of up in the air. I put it on here as a uh, group of them, but I saw a lot of people do not really consider them a true keystone species because it's a mutualist, it's two, um, but I put it in here anyway. So a mutualist is something that two species work together, um, both for their benefit. Um, so usually when we talk about ecosystem mutualists in the keystone species world, we're talking about pollinators. It takes two to tango and it takes two to pollinate. So you have a pollinator and you have the thing that's being pollinated. So bees are a primary example of this. Um, bees will take the nectar from the flowers they collect pollen, and then they go about spreading it from lots of different um, flowers to the next. Um, so when we talk about them, basically they're enhancing the odds of that fertilization and they create a greater flower growth. Um, so more DNA, more different types of um, genes being moved from different ones to another one. And so they're creating that uh, new habitat and they're allowing a lot of other things to thrive as well. 
And so when we talk about mutualists, it's always a pair. Um, in Nebraska, there's bees that populate um, and pollinate lots of different types of flowers. There's hummingbirds in certain areas that do this too. And then a specific example in Nebraska, we have what's called a yucca moth. Um, if you go out in western Nebraska, kind of towards the west, we have the yucca plant. Um, so certain species of yucca were actually um, pollinated by certain species of moths. So if one would go, the plant would go. If the plant goes, the moth goes. Um, so they are um, very, very symbolically kind of stuck with each other. So that mutualist. All right. And then you have something called keystone prey. So opposite of a predator, this is the animal that is being hunted. Um, this is a huge range of different types of animals. I, I tried to focus on a couple. Um, so ranging from tiny krill, like that are in the ocean, to hares, they play a huge role in that ecosystem. They are something that animals eat. And without those things that those animals eat, we wouldn't have our predators. And we didn't have our predators, they don't have prey. And then that whole trophic cascade kind of domino effects down. Um, so these animals, they serve as that critical food source for a lot of different predator populations. Um, usually prey, the keystone prey, are also pretty resilient creatures. Um, the picture that I have here is of a lemming. Uh, we don't have them in Nebraska, um, but they're quite prevalent um, in the northern regions of the United States and up even. Um, and these guys are they get preyed upon a lot. Um, other types of prey species, not saying that they're not important if they're not a keystone prey, but they are more likely to become rare or extinct within an organism, or sorry, an ecosystem. Um, so these are things that are very, very important um, that they need to be there. All right. Um, so what are the overall effects of our keystone species? Um, we can talk about how important they are, but what do they do when we break it down? What do they actually do? Um, they maintain habitat and the diversity of the ecosystem um, because of their abundance and the other types of species in that habitat. Um, they're also usually always, nearly always, a critical component within the local food web. So if you have the stream or this little tiny ecosystem, the prey, the predator, um, the tiny things in between, they're all connected to each other. Um, but if specifically, if you take this keystone species out, it affects the entire food web. And they usually always fill a critical ecological role that really no other species really has, has done that. So if we take that out, we lose their jobs that they're doing and we lose what they're doing in affecting the ecosystem. And then we lost that entire component for that ecosystem or that habitat. Um, so without the species, the entire ecosystem radically changes or in some very extreme cases, it will cease to exist. Um, again, a rare occasion, but it has happened before. So other species roles can change from one ecosystem to the next. So if you look at the stream habitat and you think beavers are a keystone species, they might not be in a different area or a different habitat. Um, so it is really dependent on where they are found and in cer certain ecosystems. So um, they might be critical in one, but they might not be critical in the other. Um, so they might just not be the same in two separate environments. All right, so I also tried to break up keystone species um, by the region or the ecosystem, or sometimes people call them the biomes. Um, so these are ones that are not gonna specifically focus in on Nebraska, but still very important. So when we talk about the ocean overall, um, there's quite a few different species that are critical and that are considered keystone species. So I'm just gonna touch on just a few of them. Um, sharks are gonna be one. Um, if you think about it, sharks are gonna be the predators. They're gonna be one of those top predators. Um, and they're going to have that what we call a top-down effect. So they are at the top of the food chain and they affect everything underneath them. They really impact those local habitats um, because they're eating all the fish or other animals that are sick, they are weak, they're taking out the bad things basically so they um, can clean up that ecosystem. Um, a lot of sharks will hunt groupers in certain areas, which are very large fish. Um, those groupers then will eat other things. And so um, the, the smaller things that go down the food chain, the smaller fish that the groupers eat, they will eat the things that the algae, and so they clean up the algae. So without a huge predator in that area, there's more animals to clean up the algae. Um, so in a coral reef system, 
And that's that top down cascade effect. If you remove one of those species, you have a growth of groupers, and then you're going to have a lot more algae because they're going to be eating more fish that are the ones that are cleaning up the rocks. Um, sometimes when you talk about like a coral reef, that's a great example of an ecosystem. Um, coral, so not necessarily an animal, but a polyp. Um, ivory tree coral is something that provides a habitat for more than about 300 other invertebrates. So this is the one that is creating that habitat. Um, krill are another great example. They feed a lot of different uh, animals out there. If we didn't have them, we don't have the predators. If we don't have those predators, then we have more prey. Um, and so again, that effect affects a lot of the ecosystem. And then in other parts of the area, we have what we call mangrove dwelling crabs. These are animals that actually improve the soil health. Um, which is kind of interesting. So um, you see a lots of different things from sharks to coral to krill, um, crabs, all keystone species. All right, so we're going to take a trip to the desert. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us, when we think cacti or cactus, this is maybe the thing that comes to your head, that saguaro cactus. Um, these plants make critical nesting spots for things like birds, red tail hawks, woodpeckers. Um, you might have even seen bobcats perched in a cavity in a um, cactus. So lots of different habitats for other types of animals as well. There are also important resources for sustenance. So there's animals that eat them. They provide water when there isn't a lot in there. Um, there's something called a desert tortoise, which is a very cute reptile, by the way but they dig burrows that other animals rely on for protection from predators and heat, especially in that um, hot desert environment. Also, tortoises, a lot of the times they will dig, they'll churn the soil, um, they'll create the great um, bunches of nutrients in the soil that other animals and plants rely on. Normally, when you see turtles or tortoises in an area, the plant diversity is also very high. They're also eating a lot of plants and certain uh, plants, when they pass through the digestive system of a tortoise or a different type of herbivore, they have a better chance of growing um, into another species. So again, desert tortoises are a keystone species. They're helping out. Um, one that I didn't even think about is the Australian dingo. Uh, so these guys will prey on other animals. They especially like to eat things like invasive species, um, which Australia has a ton of, and then kangaroos, which grow very quickly quickly and they grow rapidly and there's a lot of them. Uh, so they keep those populations in check in certain areas. All right, so you have this pretty boreal forest. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, it's sometimes people call it the taiga. Um, the snowshoe hare is a great example, which we kind of touched on earlier. They serve as food for the threatened Canada lynx. Um, Canada lynx, about 75% of their diet relies on the snowshoe hare. So that's quite a bit. Um, but we also talk about aspen and willow trees, the trees being the keystone species. So they provide a critical habitat for things like lichen, fungi, insects, birds, lots of plants like wild red raspberries, which are then critical food for animals, things like bees to bears. Um, so lots of different things that they will eat. All right, and then you also have the tundra. So this one is a little different just because it's cold. A lot of people think that there's not a lot there. There's a lot of snow. It's a lot of treeless environments. Um, that's okay. They still have an ecosystem and there's still animals and plants that are part of that habitat. So um, even though there's few plants and animals that can survive in that area, um, there are still things. So earlier we talked about the lemmings. These are really small rodents. Um, so they have fluctuations in their population. Some year there's a ton of them. Some year there's not. And we don't really know why, but we know that some years there's a lot, some years there's not. So it kind of just depends on the prey and the population. And so if there's a lot of prey, there's going to be a lot of things to eat them. If there's not a lot, there's not a lot that's going to eat them. So um, they feed predators like Arctic fox, snowy owls, weasels. These are all things that are affected. Their populations are affected by the amount of weasel or sorry, the amount of lemmings that are there that year. Um, they also impact the health and the composition of the vegetation that they feed on. And then another one, a bird, um, is this little black and white cute little guy right here. Um, so they poop a lot. There's a lot of these birds there uh, and they poop a lot and they actually provide compost for the local vegetation. So without these birds, we don't have the good tree diversity or the vegetation diversity that is in the tundra. 
All right, tropical rainforest. Um, fig trees are one of the keystone species in this area um, because they bear these fruits. Um, so if you didn't know what a fig looks like, this is it. Most of us maybe just think of fig newtons. <laughs> this is what you're eating. So um, these guys, this tree provides about 1,200 different types of animals with food year round. So everything from birds to bats, um, they will eat these and this is what's available. Um, also, the fig tree benefits from this because a lot of these animals like birds and bats, they eat them and then it goes through their digestive system and then they pass out and poop out the rest. Um, then they're dispersing the seeds and allowing it to grow in different areas as well to make more keystone tree fig species. Um, two examples of animals that do this a lot are the western lowland gorilla and the cassowary in Australia, these big bluebirds that you might see. Um, so what they will do is that they, again, they eat and then they um, poop it out and then those new fig trees are able to grow in different areas. So both species are benefiting from this. All right, so that was just a little bit about like the basics of them and then kind of breaking it down by different um, biome or area or ecosystem. So now I really want to focus on the different types of keystone species. So again, it was really hard to kind of factor this in or make it super Nebraska specific just because we don't have a ton of them. So I made it comparable to the whole world, but then I also talked about things that we do have here in Nebraska. So one of them, which we do not have in Nebraska, um, are the sea stars. So I've been told that starfish is incorrect because they're not fish. The correct term is sea star. So um, sea stars, um, the same species that Robert Payne, if you remember earlier, he took all of those star sea stars out of the area and then uh, basically the ecosystem collapsed. So this was his research specimen. Um, so even though the species that he used was actually relatively uncommon, he still found this huge problem when he took that species out. Um, so in in areas that lacked the sea star, um, what happened is that mussels basically outcompeted everything. And um, when he took them out, um, the 15 original species that were there were crowded out. So things like algae and anemones and sponges. When he took out those sea stars, the mussels took over and there was nothing to stop them. So um, there was not enough room for anything. So just having that uncommon keystone species in there made a huge difference for the environment. Um, within a year of his research, the biodiversity that was originally there with the sea star um, was cut in half. So when he took it out, half that um, amount of diversity just was gone just because of this one species. All right, so another one that we do not have in Nebraska, we have river otters, not sea otters. Sea otters um, are native to the northern Pacific Ocean, and they play a huge role in maintaining the health the the health of the kelp forest. So, kind of like the seaweed that you imagine growing up from the bottom of the ocean. Um, so, what happens is they eat a lot of sea urchins, which is great um, because. Um, Basically, if they don't, the sea urchins take over. They graze on everything and they take about 30 feet of kelp per month. And we might think, what's the big deal? It, it clogs up the ocean. It doesn't look very aesthetically nice. Um, those forests, they create a huge habitat for lots of other different types of animals. They provide food, shelter, a nursery habitat, sometimes for fish, um, and even a hunting grounds for lots of different other fish, um, marine mammals, and also other species. So they're critical areas that need to be protected. If we take those out, we lose all those species as well. So sea urchins, they can be kept in check by sea otters. Um, so sea otters, each sea otter, about uh, once a day, they eat about 25% of their diet every single day just in sea urchins. Um, people can also eat sea urchins as well, um, not just like eating them down the hatch, but if you would um, eat them at a restaurant, they're safe to eat as well. All right, one that we do have in Nebraska are beavers. So um, beaver systems, if you recall, those are those ecosystem engineers. So they create, destroy habitat sometimes, but that's okay. They're re-altering and reshaping the physical environment around them. Um, so what do beavers do? Um, so they will flood areas and that's okay. That's what they want to happen. Um, they form wetlands and ponds, and then also those marshy meadows where a lot of animals um, will come to have babies. They will hunt in those areas. A lot of animals like 
frogs and amphibians will lay their eggs there, um, and that is their nursery grounds. Um, also the breeding areas for lots of birds as well. Even here in Nebraska, wetlands are very important. Um, they also improve the water quality in the streams. They replenish underwater aquifers. They alleviate drought and water shortages. Um, I mean, you can just keep reading this list of all the things that beavers do just simply because they're damming a certain area. Um, also, thinking about a beaver dam versus a beaver lodge are two very different things. Um, so beaver dams are going to kind of be like what you see here where they physically block that water from going anywhere. The lodges are their um, living grounds or the living quarter area. Um, and those might even, you might see them on top, but their entrances are only going to be underwater. So they keep predators out. All right. Um, again, wolves are something else. Um, so gray wolves are considered a top predator. Um, they have that ripple effect. So if you remove them, everything that they've hunted and everything underneath them, um, that cascade effect happens. Um, studies show that they keep elk populations in check. Um, when they released wolves back into Yellowstone, there's a ton of studies about how they changed the landscape. Um, without wolves there, there was a lot of elk and they grazed on things like willow and aspen trees, which a lot of other animals need. Um, and they just overgrazed things. So with wolves there, they keep those um, prey populations in check. They also help other predators because they leave a lot of scraps. So wolves are not the like, they, they're not the cleanest and they don't eat every single piece. They often eat what they want and then they don't come back, but they leave a lot of food scraps for things like eagles and coyotes and bears even. Um, so right now uh, their historical range was huge. When you look at it now, it's just a fraction of what it was. Um, and here, like and I said, here in Nebraska, they still remain an endangered species. Um, even though we don't physically have wolves in Nebraska. We have wolf-like creatures, um, but um, we don't have like a population of a, uh, a steady population of them. All right, something we don't have in Nebraska, um, I wish, but Eastern and Southern African elephants, especially in those areas, um, these guys consume about 300 pounds of vegetation every single day. Um, so they eat things like small trees and shrubs that would basically convert their grasslands to a forest or a scrubland. That's not what they want. They want those big open wide spaces. Um, so elephants keep those um, habitats clean of those small trees that could alter or change their habitat habitat. Uh, they also support other herbivores, uh, things like zebras and wildebeest and antelopes. Um, because they're taking out those big trees, they're leaving grasses and spaces for other animals. Um, and so if thinking about just the large animals, you've got to think the things underneath as well. So keeping those um, roots and vegetation out of the way, they're making the dry soil for things like mice and shrews, which a lot of other animals eat as well. Um, for instance, lions, hyenas, and cheetahs, they all do feed on elephants every once in a while. There are a lot of meat for um, a group of animals to eat. And then again, being an herbivore and eating lots of grasses and plants and leaves, um, they will spread their dung or their feces around, um, and they will plant new seeds in new areas. So passing it through their digestive system and their gut, they poop them out, and then the odds of them growing new things in that area are more likely than if those seeds were to disperse on their own. All right, prairie dogs. This is something that is one of our critical keystone species here in Nebraska. Um, so historically, I mean, they were everywhere. Um, the grasslands of Central and North America is where they're found. Um, it's just a fraction of what they were at one time. Uh, so they're small little rodents, but they do a huge impact on things. Um, so they support um, with their burrowing and their the prey that uh, as them as prey, they support about 130 other species. So everything from things like rattlesnakes to salamanders to birds to insects, um, all those animals rely on prairie dogs some way or another. Um, but they're a good food source. A lot of animals like coyotes and eagles will eat them. Um, Black-footed ferrets, which are a very endangered species here in the United States, they almost solely eat prairie dogs. So without them, we don't have black-footed ferrets. Um, and they're also an ecosystem engineer. So they dig those massive tunnels and the burrow systems. Um, they maintain a health 
of the grasslands by churning the soil and aerating it. Um, they also, with their underground colonies, they also help vegetation to thrive in those areas. So again, creating and churning and mixing those nutrients in the ground helps other grazers as well because there's a wide variety of grassland species to eat. And then the burrows, like I mentioned, provide shelter for a lot of other animals. Um, and then if they would allow, if they were gone, those woody plants would take over our prairies and we wouldn't have prairies. We would have a woody plant scene. I don't know what to call it, but it would not be a true prairie. Um, so prairie dogs are very important here in Nebraska. But again, a lot of people see them as a nuisance species, but one still that should be protected. All right, bees um, are very important. Uh, about 90% of the world's flowers are pollinated from our bees. And when I talk about bees, it's not honeybees. They're fine. Um, they're going to do okay. Um, they're basically a domesticated species. Um, we're talking about the things like bumblebees and carpenter bees and leaf cutter bees, our native bee species. Um, these are ones that pollinate fruits and vegetables and other crops. Um, they produce seeds like nuts and berries. Um, they're very important here in Nebraska as well. But again, we're really talking about not the honeybees. Um, so without these bees, they're again that bottom up. So they're smaller and animals. Um, they're not preying upon other things. We would have a consequence in the top of the food chain. Um, so we wouldn't have flowers for grazers. We wouldn't have grazers for the predators to eat. Um, so if we didn't have those bees, a lot of other things would collapse if we didn't have them. All right, and then one that's really important here in Nebraska, especially, are bison. So bison have been here for a long time. They've been grazing on the prairie and been serving as a keystone species for nearly 10,000 years. Um, critical species, not just in Nebraska, but for the prairie. And when you, besides prairie dogs, when you think of that like quintessential species, you're thinking of bison. Um, so their grazing patterns versus cattle are very different. Um, cattle also graze, but bison do it very differently. Um, so their grazing patterns, they graze at different heights, um, which provides great habitat for things like ground nesting birds. Um, and then they also influence a natural fire regime, um, which is important then for grassland birds, other types of birds, small mammals, larger grazers. Um, so a lot of people think that wildfires are bad. And yes, they can be very devastating. But when we talk about a prairie, a controlled prairie burn is actually very good for a habitat. It gets all the old woody stuff out of the way and allows new native species to grow. And that also helps our large grazers and things like prairie dogs and birds and everything above. All right, bison. Oops. Um, bison also make these things called a wallow or a depression in the soil, um, which you probably have seen before, um, but basically they roll and since they're so large, they pack down the soil really well um, and they create kind of little depression in there called a wallow. Um, when it rains, it fills with water. This offers a really great temporary drinking pond or a breeding pool for things like amphibians. Um, they also collect water for long periods of time, which other animals could use. The prairie is a pretty unforgiving place most of the time. So when animals are able to find water, that's something that they can grab. Um, they provide special habitat for plants, these wallows, um, usually rare plants, by the way, just because they need so much water or they need a certain area of the uh, soil to grow in. Uh, we don't necessarily have them anymore in Nebraska, but long-billed curlew, um, they use the bison droppings as camouflage, which is right, strange. Um, this bird um, basically will build a nest that mimics a bison dropping, so that bison um, pie that you usually see. And then also some other birds will use bison uh, dung to line their nests because it's soft. Um, burrowing owls will also use it. They'll sometimes build their underground nest right next to it, or they will pull in the bison dung because what's attracted to bison dung? Insects. And when um, those insects come, that's something then that the food that like a burrowing owl can reach out and grab. Uh, prairie dogs also prefer to nest in areas where bison heavily graze. At one point when we had lots of wild bison in the world, that was something that they do. Now it's a little bit different just because we don't have a ton of wild bison out there. All right, also in the winter time, when we think about it, bison are ginormous. They are, have a huge head, they have these thick shoulders, and what they do is when it 
got very cold and there was a lot of snow in the prairie, they just trudge through it and they make this highway for other animals that are not so big, like pronghorn um, and elk that were able to move from place to place in the winter because of these highways that were dug in the snow by bison. Um, also, their foraging patterns allows other animals to reach those grasses in the cold that they might not have otherwise. Um, they're able to graze and move the snow. Uh, pronghorn and elk can graze on certain grasses that they might not have available if we didn't have bison. Uh, there was a cool study that I found in Kansas where basically they looked at uh, cows and they looked at bison and both are grazers, both are here and they do certain things. Um, bison showed that when they grazed, the number of native plant species that after they grazed was about 86% when they came back. So they grazed all this stuff and then when the plants came back, they had a huge number of native plant species to that area that came back. Well, when cows did it, they did the same. Um, they also grazed, and but they only had about 30% native species come back. They had all that other woody vegetation that came up as well. Um, so it just is kind of showing that um, bison are just those prairie animals, whereas cows were something that were introduced. And they do similar effects, but it's nowhere near those bison for the prairie. And then also um, bison will create a greater habitat and just a variety in the landscape. Um, so those are something to consider when um, a lot of farmers now, they're actually wanting bison or ranchers, they want bison on their property uh, simply because they know all the things that they can do. The problem is there's just a very, 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 very small number of true bison out there. Um, one huge place that you can find them is Yellowstone. Those have remained true um, thoroughbred, thoroughbred bison through the years. Um, a lot of the bison now that you might see are related to cows somehow. They're hybrids of um, cows and bison. All right, and I cannot forget plants. Plants always kind of get seem to be shoved aside, um, but they are a huge bunch of plants that are keystone species. So I wanted to take a minute to kind of talk about plants. And there's really two different types of keystone plants. Um, there's host plants that feed young caterpillars or young larvae of pollinators or different types. Um, these are about 90% of all of them are going to be butterflies and moths just because that's what they do. Um, things like oak plants, elm, pine, chestnut, fir, hickory. Um, so those are those um, host plants for the caterpillars. But then you also have to think about um, plants that feed bee specialists. So these are bees that only pollinate certain types of plants um, and we have to be able to feed them too. So without the bees and the plants, they both go away. Those are things like sunflowers, goldenrods, prairie clover, coneflowers. Um, those are the ones that those specific specialist bees will feed on. But then you also have trees. Trees are very important as well. Um, white oak, river birch, crab apple, the eastern cottonwood are also considered keystone species as well. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. So again, I highly apologize for all the technical issues that we had. I really appreciate everyone sticking around. I'm actually very uh, surprised that everyone stuck around that long. So thank you. Um, but I will email all of you that attended and registered today um, with some information. Um, one of my coworkers and I recently did a few months ago, we did what's called our nature nerd night, uh, where we sit on zoom and we talk with some experts in the field. Um, and we did a keystone species one. So I can link that video also as well in the registry or in our email that I send you. Um, and then also we have four more uh, science ofs coming up. So next week we're going to be talking about prairie chickens. So a little early even for their booming, but we're going to talk about prairie chickens. And then we are going to talk about science of darters and minnows, some dragonflies and damselflies. And then we're going to kind of wrap up our winter series with ungulates. If you don't know what an ungulate is, I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to come guess, but I put context clue for you. You can see a deer there. So something to do with hooved animals. Um, so we're going to talk about those here, and I will give the registrations in my email for all of these if you'd like to register for them. Um, and then I highly suggest checking out our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube. Uh, when I was going through all the people that did our evaluations and SurveyMonkey, thank you, by the way, that those that did that. We like to make our programs better the best way we can. Um, I saw a lot of you that put things that you want to see a science of. of. Um, I saw a lot of things like birds and raptors and pollinators. Um, we did a raptors 
we've done fungi, we've done a lot of those topics that you guys asked for. So please check out our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube and then our playlist Science Of. You can go through and look, there's two years worth of videos there so you can see um, all the ones that we've done before. And you might find one that you really want to see. Um, we also have our Facebook page. I would highly encourage if you're on Facebook to uh, like us or follow us. That's the best way to understand what's going on um, and events that we have. And then also our Instagram page is another great way. And then also just our wildlife education website. If you want more information or activities or we have some education trunks that you can check out, all that information is there as well. All right, so that was our keystone species. Um, again, I really do apologize for the technical issues. I It was out of my control, but um, I do appreciate everyone sticking on. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen, um, but I'm gonna check the chat here. Oh gosh, 41. All right, hopefully, um, I'm not gonna go through all these here, but if anyone does have any really good questions, um, someone said, if I can't attend the meeting, um, yes, I will, like I mentioned, I will have these recorded for everyone. Um, people talk about ferrets. Uh, someone said they like elephants. Okay, Black Hills wolves are not present anymore. The elk have decimated the aspen tree colonies. Now we resort to fencing to exclude the elk. Um, so yeah, so you are literally witnessing firsthand how those keystone species have um, a huge effect on their property or that land. Um, it, again, it, it usually kind of follows the keystone species as animals that people don't like or people find a nuisance to. So it kind of has that correlation effect. If you think about beavers, wolves, um, prairie dogs, People can find problems with all those animals, but there's science evidence showing, look what they do and look how they help. Um, I also heard a biologist when we did our nature nerd night kind of talk about um, it also kind of, we do want keystone species and we want to talk about them, but there was someone else that also mentioned a biologist that said, don't pay too much stock into that. Um, yes, these species are important and yes, the science is showing that, but it also shows that just how critical everything is that's wrapped together in an ecosystem. Um, I like to believe, you know, biologists, I trust my science, but I also think that there's enough evidence showing those keystone species and the effects that they have. So yes, pay homage to them and like understand how important they are. Um, someone asked, since zebra mussels are non-native, um, that are not native keystone species to keep them in check, um, and you don't want to introduce another name. Yes, um, so biological controls, they rarely work. So someone was asking, um, a great example is like in Australia, there was the sugarcane incident where there was all the pests that were eating the sugarcane. And so let's release a bunch of um, cane toads into the environment to see if that would take care of it. But now we have another invasive species that we're worrying about. Um, so at one, we just have to be very careful with biological controls. Um, but yes, you want to, you, there has to be something that can take care of those uh, non-native species. Um, someone today are, um, Fisheries person was talking about how there is someone that's making like a whiskey out of green invasive crabs. Um, not that you might want to drink it, but it's just the fact that that's a way to take those things out of the environment safely. Um, so there's there's strange things that happen. Um, let's see. So that's all that I see. Um, if someone really has, I know we're kind of running towards that four o'clock line here, but if anyone has um, a question, you are welcome to email me. I'll go ahead and put my email directly in the chat for all of you. And again, if I do not know the answer, I will find someone that can um, do that as well. Someone said on the radio, they heard they were making a bee vaccination. I have not heard anything like that. Like, like how would, like, how would they, do they like inject the bees or inject the colony or, okay. I, yeah, that's super interesting. I have not heard that. So someone said it was on the news today. Okay. Um, I apparently don't pay attention to the news. So um, that's really interesting. I've never heard about that. So yeah, science is cool. Look at all the cool stuff that's out there. So, all right. Again, I, I cannot thank you enough for those that uh, stuck around. Thank you. Um, I will go ahead and put this on YouTube tomorrow so you can rewatch it. Um, I will do my best to have my technology better prepared for next week when we talk about prairie chickens. Same time Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. I will see everyone there. So um, again, thank you everyone. And um, be sure to look for that email because if you do that survey monkey, you get some prizes. So thank you everyone. I appreciate it again.
Thank you. Bye, everyone.